Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Fleming. I'm director of the Des Moines Art Center. This is our first in-person lecture since COVID began. So I'm especially happy to welcome you here tonight. To introduce our program tonight, I thought I would use a quote from Marcel Duchamp. He was a pioneering artist and a leading figure in the Dada movement. He argued that both the artist and the viewer are necessary for the completion of a work of art, and theorized that while the creation of the art begins with the artist, it is not completed until it is placed out in the world and viewed by others. He states, all in all, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator, spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his or her contribution to the creative act. The exhibition immersive relies on the artist to enter an environment wholly created by the artist. These spaces are filled not only with visuals, but with sound and sometimes movement. So tonight we're gonna to learn how artists from three different disciplines are motivated by redefining this relationship between the work and the viewer. Each of our three panelists will give 15 minute presentations about their work followed by a question and answer that is moderated by the curator of the show, Laura Burkhalter. She is our curatorial manager and she has been with us since 1999 and she created numerous exhibitions for the Arts Center. Her latest project before Immersive was Justin Favela, Central America. So this program tonight is developed in partnership with Ballet Des Moines. We're thrilled to work with them on this project. Um, and I have to put a plug in for them. They will present Of Gravity and Light on April 22nd at 7 p.m. at Des Moines, um, at the Des Moines Civic Center, Des Moines Performing Arts. So you can get your tickets for it at Des Moines Performing Arts. So first I'll introduce each speaker and then they'll come up uh, and give their presentation and we'll continue with the program. Bo Kenyon is composer in residence with Ballet Des Moines and on the faculty of the College of Arts, Media and Design at Northwestern University. He is a queer composer who explores time-based sound performance, interdisciplinary collaboration and immersive audience techniques. Kenya has earned national and international residencies and fulfilled countless commissions and has presented at local, regional, national, and international arts, science, and humanitarian organizations. In 2016, he became the first composer in residence for the Boston Public Library. And he has since created performance installations that explore non-linear storytelling for organizations such as the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. His current work is of gravity and light. It's a 55 minute stage contemporary ballet which explores the science of the solar system through music, dance, video, projection. Uh, obviously presented by Ballet Des Moines. Uh, da Young Young is a principal dancer with the Oklahoma City Ballet. She has a huge, extensive resume. She was born in South Korea. She trained at uh, Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet Academy, where she graduated with honors. She was a semi-finalist at the Sigra Liefer International Ballet Competition held at Danesca, uh, Ukraine in 2006. Her extensive repertoire includes The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, Romeo and Juliet, Beauty and the Beast, Firebird, Sleeping Beauty, and The Little Mermaid and she has performed the title roles or was featured in ballets such as Giselle, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and La, uh, La Silphide. And she's performed lead roles in Mowgli, The Jungle Book Ballet, Peter Pan, Dracula, as well as George Balanchine's Rubies and Serenade, Twilight Tharp's Nine Sinatra Songs, Rafi, excuse me, Robert Joffrey's Pas de Tessé, and Ma Chong's Forgotten Memories. Um, as a choreographer, her work, Vignettes, was recently chosen as the audience favorite at the Milwaukee Ballet Competition Genius International Choreographer Competition. 
And she has also invited to present her work, Dis Dissipation, uh, at the Five Moons Dance Festival in August of 2021. Artist and founder of Off-Screen Motion Pictures, Oyuram, is the 2022 Des Moines Art Center Tony and Tim Urban International Artist in Residence. This program aims to bring international artists, particularly of Jewish heritage, to the Art Center and to the communities that we serve. Um, Yoram is the definition of an international artist. He was born in Jerusalem, studied engineering, but was quickly drawn to cinema. He received an undergraduate degree in film at the Beitz Zev School for the Forming Arts in Ramat Gan and moved to Paris where he studied cinematic theory at the Sorbonne. Uh, he now has a home base in Des Moines, we're pleased to say. He has designed monumental visual moving images. His visual work has been commissioned by prestigious companies such as Cartier, Van Klepp and Arpel, Sunny, Dior, Louis Vuitton, and in 2018, he created Mental Banquet, Painting with Life for the Greater Des Moines Public Art Foundation. And this two-night show was projected on the east side of the World Food Prize. So now, we'll welcome Bo. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're very, very excited to be working with you and the, your team at the Art Center here to be putting on this show tonight as we get ready for Of Gravity and Light and that premiere on April 22nd. We are so excited for this project and for this premiere that will be happening one night only on the 22nd and kicking off um, two audience engagement events um, a week starting today. And so this is just... Um, a wonderful way to start this whole season. So what I'd like you to do right now is to simply close your eyes, please. Take one big deep breath in. And listen, and if I can get a cue on the music, please. group, but I'm going to ask some people to just open their eyes, or everyone can open their eyes, <laughs> um, to raise your hand. What did you hear in this? Is there anyone who feels brave to shout out or raise a hand? Yes. The striking of a match. Yep, the striking of a match. What else did you hear? Yes. A horn, yep, yeah, there was a horn, yep. Yeah. Flute. Flute, there was a clarinet, so very close. Anything else that you heard? Dissonance. Say it again? Dissonance. Dissonance, yeah. And now what did you feel or imagine as you were listening? Eerie, yeah, okay. Any Dawn, sure. Anything else? Waves of sound. So this is a tiny sliver of an excerpt from Movement 7 of Gravity and Light where we're exploring the concept that light is both a particle and a wave, while also exploring the literal makeup of the sun itself. Let's try it again. Close your eyes, please. And if I could have the second cue. Again, we're not going to go through this exercise again, but 
really what I'm trying to get at is the fact that sound is an intrinsically immersive experience. That we as, as able-bodied humans can't not hear sound, right? Um, but there's a difference, obviously, between sound and listening. And the big part of what my work is, is not trying to overthrow whatever sound happens to exist in an environment, but rather listen to the environment around me, think about what it is I'm trying to express as an artist and as a composer, and hear how I can integrate my practice within that existing environment, right? How can I tap into that experience that we have when we're in an immersive environment, when we are open, when we are curious, um, and we are ready to listen deeply and start to imagine, start to attach to the exact sound. Um, one of the pieces that I worked on that is an actual immersive piece um, was when I was a composer in residence at the Boston Public Library. They built a residency for me for this piece, which is exploring themes and concepts of As You Like It by Shakespeare, specifically looking at social and political themes that were present um, in Shakespeare's play that are still present today. It was very curious and interesting to me to think about the library as a democratic space, um, a space of knowledge, but a space for discourse of ideas. And how can I contribute to what the library is there for while also listening to the library? What sounds am I hearing? How, does, how are the acoustics in the library? What, how can I build a piece for nine live musicians, create that, write that score, and then work with a choreographer who then pairs dancers to embody the sound that they're hearing of the musicians. Um, captivating audiences in a way that plays on the already immersive experience that we have in these beautiful buildings. Um, how the sound, hearing the birds above us, and how can I build a resonant piece that takes that into account? while then captivating audiences who are coming there on purpose, ideally, but also how do I create this essence of magic that is disruptive but not um, overbearing, right? I want to disrupt to help people think about things maybe or look at things differently or hear things a little bit differently. Um, so people who are there at cafe tables to study or have a meeting stop for a moment and not only listen and enjoy this experience but also hopefully listen to the library itself a little bit differently. Um, a challenging piece, which came after this, was a piece I was commissioned to do um, in collaboration with Fujiko Nakaya. If you don't know, Fujiko Nakaya is an internationally acclaimed fog artist. She makes these gorgeous, fleeting, sumptuous, magical fog sculptures that were commissioned for, by the Emerald Necklace Conservancy for Emerald Necklace, which is in, in um, Boston. The challenge here is that fog is wet, <laughs> so I can't do any sort of live music. Um, the challenge, too, is that I wanted to inter truly integrate with Fujiko's brilliant work, so I didn't want to bring in amps and speakers and say, oh, and by the way, ignore this ugly um, equipment, right? I wanted to make sure that this was growing out of the magic that Fujiko was creating. So what I did is had, you can see here, the soprano here in the, in the foreground has a, a cape or a train that is fitted with speakers and MP3 players that play the sound installation that I created. Likewise, all the dancers are fitted with similar costumes. So they're playing the, the, the sound installation that I created that then envelopes and works through the audience and literally immerses and walks around and through them as the fog also does. Um, this particular piece, which I'll have you play in just a moment, um, was built through a community engagement project that I did with teenagers who had recently become American citizens. And I sat with them for many weeks on end, interviewing them, voice recording them about their definitions of success, family, home, identity, values. Um, and if you could tr play it for just a moment, please. I'm from Haiti and I'm from Kenya. Oh, my name is Wavi Gomes and I'm from Oh, my name is Honorina and I'm Kivardian and I've been in the US for four years. And then this project is going on. My name is Hashem Spina. I am from Dominican Republic. My name is Abdul Kadir Ibrahim. I'm from Somalia and I've lived in Boston. People will treat you differently based on who you work for, where you work, and why you work. 
about you. I do not want to forget where you came from. People will treat you differently based on the way you look, who you work for, where you work, and why you work there. My name is Amadou Barry. I'm from So adding to the layer of that, the soprano, um, Grammy award-winning Sarah Braley, who's a good friend and a wonderful human, um, was singing in the recording, but also singing live, riffing on different musical elements that were embedded in the sound installation. So giving the illusion of resonance or reverberation, which of course doesn't exist in an outdoor setting. So solving for that problem as well. Um, what was interesting is that a member of the Museum of Fine Arts witnessed this um, and was interested in me bringing and creating a new movement that integrated with the Museum of Fine Arts because Candace Breitz was doing, um, had her installation there, Love Story, which is dealing with similar themes, but really layering in um, fame and notoriety on top of it, top of identity and immigrant voices. Um, what's interesting to me is that the environment completely changes the context of the piece. Thinking of the MFA versus a democratic space and this open to the public, um, like a park, also, the fact that we were, Fujiko and I were creating the immersive environment for audience to have that dialogue, whereas at the MFA, though I would never take this back, it was just interesting to think that in this case, the sound and the performer were immersed by the freneticism and energy of the MFA and the audience there. So not swallowed up, but had to intentionally cut through that space to make a statement and to be observed. Um, again, River Constellation, which was the sliver that I showed at the beginning, thinking again about environment being such an important part for me in terms of the sound world, in terms of how it integrates with whatever artistic intention I have as a composer, and then in this case, a permanent sculpture, how do I create that magic that is fleeting that you have to experience by being there in, in, a, in, a, in a permanent sculpture? And so solved for that by making um, a two and a half hour piece that plays on a loop from 5 a.m. until midnight and making it wide enough and varied enough um, that it feels different. Like when you go into the park itself, it's the same sound world all the time. However, when you go at five o'clock in the morning, it may sound very different than six o'clock at night. So trying to capture that essence as well. So now how do I create that on a stage? <laughs> which is a completely artificial construct environment. We can create whatever we want to. Um, and so it's more about how do we get the audience to have that internal immersive feeling of curiosity, of wonder, of connection, of attachment um, while they're sitting in the audience? How do I get them from a passive listener or engagement to actively wonder and connect in their mind? So. Um, very formative and foundational to my practice is, is, is um, interdisciplinary collaboration. And so this is an example, just a clip of movement four, where we're exploring this concept of lunar retreat, where the, it's a scientific phenomenon that the moon is slowly drifting away from us about four centimeters a year. And using that as not just an interesting sort of visual as a, as a creator and a composer, but also as a foundation to explore loss, to explore grief, to explore even our own death. So if you could um, play, please. And then giving a visual with, this is Yu Wen Wu and her video work, that is still in draft form, just to be clear. <laughs>
So this idea of being able to, and I think actually if you could help get to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. This idea of, yes, tapping into the sound itself, but I find that, that it helps me as a creator and a composer, I find it interesting to work with choreographers like Tom Mattingly and video installation artists like Yu Wen. Um, it helps me in my practice, but I feel like it also helps to get audience into that immersive mindset, giving them something visual to hold on to while also exploring the story that's being told. Um, and if you could play this one as well, this is the last sound from movement one. And so this concept, really, in terms of working with this wonderful team and thinking about what my perspective is in terms of reaching audiences, so helping to instill this sense of wonder and curiosity that Tom, you, Wen, also our dancers or musicians or light designer, adding a bit of magic so that not just immersed in the piece, but you get lost in the piece, that you, at moments, in the, over this 55 minute period, find yourself almost transported to the stage itself while the dancers themselves are literally immersed in this giant um, video projection by Yu and Wu, and while working with the choreography from Tom Mattingly. So I really, truly hope you can make it. And I truly hope that afterwards we can share a glass of wine, you can tell me if I did my job well. <laughs> um, and that's, I just want to thank you all for listening and everyone who was credited and um, photography and, and who contributed to this uh, project. So thank you all very much. Thank you for the <laughs>
One of the unique things about ballet is that it's done in tutu and point shoes. When I was a little girl, I saw ballet on TV and loved watching the dancers moving gracefully across the stage. I was inspired to try ballet and it became my career. When I started, I very quickly um, found out how it, it, um, difficult ballet is, and I was even impressed by some ballet performances, how easy they all look, ballet look. Before I studied ballet, it's an, um, as an audience member, I didn't understand the hard work and dedication it took to make each step look effortless. I think as a performer, what is interesting about ballet and performance in general is that there's two big concepts to think about, technique and artistry. Technique is something every ballet dancer works on every day in morning class. We warm up our bodies and make sure that we are all putting our body parts in its proper place in order to execute the steps correctly. Ballet is very technically challenging, and we are never perfect, but are always working towards perfection. A technically, um, technically strong dancer is very impressive and inter interesting to watch perform on stage. It's like um, you're watching Olympic athletes compete at the top level of their sports. Seeing someone do 32 fuertes, so fuerte is the, we would say that's the hardest step in ballet, so you do 32 consecutive turns at the very long like, um, ballet, and it is amazing to see, and that is really like that I like to work on when I'm rehearsing and practicing. However, there's another crucial component to ballet that makes it fun to watch and helps us connect with the audience, and that is artistry. Artistry is what makes a dancer unique. It's not just being able to do the steps, but being able to put what we are feeling into it. When a dancer with beautiful artistry comes on stage, they can make even simply step interesting and beautiful to watch. Our job as a ballet dancer is to tell a story without speaking, using only music and bodies. The way we move needs to reflect how our character is feeling in a believable way. This is our mission as a dancer on stage to connect with the audience and make them feel emotions. As a principal dancer, I feel the most pressure to carry the story we are telling for example, I danced the role of Juliet in the famous Shakespeare ballet, Romeo and Juliet, for the first time eight years ago. I did the same role again in 2019. Even though I played the same role, it was a very different experience and different approach because of experience I gained in the years between. Artistry evolves over time. The way we dance can change as we grow, get stronger, and learn more about ourselves as people. My first time performing Juliet, I remember I was so concerned with doing everything the right way to get the character right and tell the story for audience. When I returned to the role, after years of dancing and learning about myself, I felt much more comfortable trying to do new, step, new things 
or trying things that I felt right for me instead of worrying about telling the story correctly. It felt more like I was inviting the audience to join my world of Juliet to see my interpretation of the story. I was dancing for myself, and even though it may sound like it closes the dancer off from the audience, it actually did the exact opposite. The audience can feel the dancer is feeling because they are so being themselves in those moments on stage. This feels so fulfilling as a dancer, and when I'm in the audience, I enjoy seeing this kind of performance so much more. This is what artistry is for a ballet dancer. Putting on a performance is not just dancing ballet. There's a music, costume, set, so many components for a show to go well. The audience of seeing the whole world of ballet, not just the dancing part. As a choreographer, I have to consider all of these things when I'm making a piece, not just the dancing. When I move to the front of the room, I start noticing things I never had as a dancer. As a dancer, our whole job is to move in a way that connects with the audience to tell a story. It's very individual. We focus on ourselves. Moving into, uh, moving into the role of choreographer, I started to think much more about the audience than I ever did as a dancer. Will they like it? Will they come away with a new perspective or thinking about what I wanted to convey with my piece? Did I make challenge them in some way or open their eyes to something they hadn't seen before? Now I have to focus on the whole picture, the costume, the set, lighting, music, directing the dancers on stage and how they move around it as a whole to make something interesting for the audience to see and connect with. It's not just that one step, but as a whole concept to tell a story. Stepping into the world of choreography is like stepping into the ocean. It's a space of limitless potential. When I first started choreographing, I felt so much excitement that when I thought all of these possibilities of movement and concept that, that I could explore. When you make choreography, you aren't just limited to classical ballet step. There are also other styles you can do, like neoclassical and contemporary. These styles don't have as strict of a structure as um, classic, classical ballet does. Pure classical ballet has a set number of positions and movement you can do. We are trying to move perfectly and do the steps exactly right. In neoclassical ballet, you have a little more freedom. You are still doing ballet, but it's not as structured. New classical about, um, style is actually the result of a choreographer, a very famous one, George Balanchine, wanting to explore movement beyond classical ballet. In contemporary, you have complete freedom. You can do things that you'd consider ugly in ballet, like turning your legs, flex your foot, or curve your spine, and that is all okay. Professional dancers are expected to be able to dance in all of these styles so that when a choreographer comes to create a piece, they have as much 
freedom as possible to make whatever they want. Just this year, we worked with an amazing choreographer, Jessica Lang. She set a contemporary work on us called Two Familiar Spaces in Dream. In this piece, the dancers were wearing white costumes, danced on a stage with a little light, just a black background and big white boxes set in a different structure on stage throughout the piece. I was able to be in the audience for this piece, and there were moments where I would see a dancer walking on the boxes as other dancers moved them across the stage or a dancer would be standing on top of a box as he spun around in circle, or sliding down a slanted box and jumping from one to another. And it would make me wonder what it all meant. This is common in contemporary choreography. A lot of times, the choreographer will leave it up to the audience to decide what a piece means. Jessica didn't even tell the dancers the meaning. She wanted each one of us to create our own story for the part we are dancing so that we would feel something meaningful to us when we perform. And like we were talking about before, when a dancer is being the most themselves, is when they make the strongest connection with the audience. Contemporary and neoclassical styles are not as popular as a classical story ballet even days. I think this is because a lot of times it's easier for um, audience to understand what's going on in a story ballet. It's like watching a book come to a life on stage. Since contemporary might not have as clear of a story, it's harder to connect with an audience, but I think it is so important as a choreographer to experiment with a new ideas and try to reach an audience in new ways. Balanchine's new classical style wasn't popular at first. It was groundbreaking, but people had trouble accepting this new style. But it's become very famous in ballet companies all over the world feel honored when they are allowed to perform a Balanchine work. These days, contemporary choreography is becoming more and more popular every year, every season. Another ballet company will start saying, we need to have contemporary work this season. Because audience are starting to like and appreciate it. It is very important to keep pushing forward with our ideas and choreography and to continue to push for dance to evolve and inspire people. Ultimately, whether it's classical ballet, neoclassical, contemporary, hip hop, dance is not completed without an audience. Sharing your energy on stage with an audience as a dancer is an indescribable, amazing feeling. And as an audience member, it's incredibly inspiring to see. As a choreographer, the joy and an honor I feel getting the opportunity to turn my feelings and thoughts into work that people come to watch is so fulfilling. I hope you will take an interest in dance, go see a ballet or contemporary work, and notice that how you feel watching someone completely giving themselves to you on the stage. It's an experience unlike any other, and I feel so lucky to be a part of this world of art and beauty. Thank you so much for coming today. It's been a pleasure to share this with you all. Thank you.
Good evening. Sometimes I think of myself with a lot of privilege that I'm not dealing with what we call in French a spectacle vivant. It means a live show that every evening you have to face a new challenge. Is it going well or not? What will be the problem? I do it once and then it's rolled by itself. So this is the advantage of cinema and fixed image regarding and comparing to what we call spectacle vivant in French. So this image that you see is a, the only way that I found to capture my display here. I don't know how many of you uh, was able to visit this uh, seven story display that I have that I'm playing now in the art center. All right. Um, so this is a picture that was taken in a 360 degrees camera. That is the only way for me to, re to, to capture the whole four walls uh, you see here. Any other picture would take one wall or the other, but I want to have an image that describes the whole display. Even though, in the real life, we always make choices where to look. But when we are making this choice to look this way and not the other way, in real life, the other way still exists. And I think that this is what I wanted to capture and to relate in this, uh, this, in this installation. The idea that even if you choose, you make your choice to look somewhere, the rest of your immersive surrounding exists. I would like to make a fast tour from many installations that I have done through something that brought me to this one. So it is a story that we have a few parts. Um, 2007, so a long time ago. This was my first idea of immersion. It was a store in Paris, in Dior, it was the headquarters of Dior, and there is a rotunda in this place. In this rotunda, I have decided to propose a series of windows around that will display one image one image that's surrounding this place. And by doing so, I create an effect of immersion. It means that you are not looking at something, you are looking through something. And this, for me at the time, was a first discovery of what will be um, driving my walk for many years. So this was my first sketch, and each window here is a screen. So there are different screens synchronized that describe a window, and it, so you see the image through the window. There is an inside, and there is an outside. This is the same simulation in the boutique. So you see this uh, part of the rotunda, and we have this idea of a kind of a balcony, that's surrounding the place, and we become a kind of observatory or something like that. Things happen upstairs. You see donc, uh, people walking around and a story in a, this is the realization. So before it was just simulation. This is a, a real photo of um, the opening. So the, the uh, balustrade around describe the limit beyond that separate between the inside and the outside to this window. So what I discover here, that when you're looking at a window, you don't look at the screen, like it's a movie at home. You are looking through the window somewhere. So by creating this window, I realized that something happened in the perception of my viewer. Therefore, the synchronization of many windows condition the, the idea or tell the people where they are. For example, 
Um, so this is an image of the whole tree and had 60 degree of, the, of this uh, wall. So therefore, when you have a very large display that take the same principle of window, therefore you are standing and looking through the window. So it's not one image. The synchronization of all this window in the high definition also participate to create this illusion of an outside. Therefore, my, um, my scenery, my story, is a story that happened outside of a window. This was the first, let's say, immersive 360 degree that I have made on 2007 in Paris, and it created many children all around the world. I want to talk with you about and show you something different that also is... Actually, I share with you some image from my kitchen, so I didn't bring my uh, chef uh, hat. But this, this picture are uh, picture that I have. Uh, this is uh, um, South um, uh, Korea. This is uh, Seoul. Um, and this building with the tulip is a, now a landmark in Seoul in a kind of architecture. It's also a boutique Dior. By the way, I arrived to Dior because I create a 26 fiction movie that was visible in one large space that I call at the time Retrophobie, Chanson d'amour et folie pure, that was a 26 uh, short story. And people can move around with a headphone that allowed them to hear what they see. I mean, the, from the same geographic place, the family can look around and each will hear something else, depend on the direction of his uh, head, let's say. And at this time, I was contacted by LVMH, which is the headquarter of this different mark, luxury brand and I was asked to collaborate with them on different display. So this was uh, the Dior Montaigne that we saw before was the first walk of this very long series of uh, walk. So this uh, building, uh, here I have, uh, this is my photography that I took yesterday before when I creating this, uh, I created this uh, PowerPoint uh, because I kept these uh, stairs that we will see here, you see. This is the stairs. This is the reality of the stairs. And here was my sketch also for my kitchen. So I took this spiral uh, uh, um, staircase that was reflective and mirror, and I create a 12th picture that are all synchronized together, also in a frame that also kind of mirror that allowed and, and was playing image that go slowly down, as if you are going up in an elevator or in climbing up. The effect that this moving image has on the audience was quite stunning. They felt that they can walk up the stairs in a much more ease than if this image would not exist because it's a kind of uh, a relative uh, movement, as when you spark and somebody else move around you and you don't know if your car or the other moves. So the idea of having this image going down, I mimic here, the, I was inspired by a ascension in the Eiffel Tower, when you have the bar going down and you go up and you see the city, and I interfer in it also image from Paris that I add to it. So this was a display that you see there at the end of this boutique. And this is uh, the real, uh, it's still playing. It was made in uh, 2015, I think. This was the opening. It is still playing there in uh, Seoul. When I was trying to formulate what I want to say with seven story high, I look at my archives and I found a document that I couldn't open 
it was a PDF with a password that I don't remember. I didn't remember. I tried everything. <laughs> so I found the in design that was the original tool that I used to create this PDF. And I opened it. And I found here's a document that was written in 2011 that described word by word what I did two months when I did here, then I opening here in the art center, my seven story. And this was a kind of prototype and that I completely forgot, really. So to show you how big is the head that you can actually lose trace of memory. So here I really say exactly, I mean, I will just quote one page, one uh, sentence. The innovation act in the elevator visual project experiment with the new way of storytelling, including a simulation of elevator ascension. Each level is a story opening into a new visual chapter. The elevator transport the viewer from the level etage to another from one visual sequence to the next. And this is even the, the timing, six minutes, was exactly what I use here. This is, uh, was very curious. And it kind of closed this, um, uh, this story. So this was part of this um, PDF, was an illustration that I made also 2011 of this elevator. It was bigger than what I did. And this is inside also a simulation. At the time, it was made by screen and not by LED. LED is the technology I use here in the art center that allowed actually by small tiles to compose an endless uh, image. There is no contour to it. So the image here, I, have, I was limited by the, by the frame. So it is, uh, let's say, this is the difference between technology that I have at 2000 and uh, 11 and today. So for those who didn't see it, it is a industrial elevator, a simulation of it on four wall. So you are um, stepping really inside a space. The idea of this um, space to step in, it is also to define where you are as a viewer the sound of this elevator, very mechanic, the, um, a, a, um, the wall that you will see going down or up, depend where the elevator is going, the door closing like a prison or very menacing, so this metallic um, sound and visual create a space which is completely distinguished between uh, in between the interior of this elevator and the outside, the outdoor when the door will open on the sequence outside. And this was important for me to, in the effect, in the illusion of the feeling of immersion. Immersion, um, metaverse, I think that all these keywords I should uh, give back to the host and find a new vocabulary to describe what I'm doing to get tomorrow, because actually this uh, virtual space, I want to connect it with what we heard before at the beginning, this uh, spectacle vivant, um, live uh, theater, dance, music, that I actually project or imagine that I create a, a, a virtual space in which I can convey and invite different artists into this um, virtual space. So it is a virtual space that also can include other disciplines. And I'm looking forward for this kind of a conversion between what I do and other disciplines to bring them, fuse them together in a kind of new step in the visual art uh, adventure. Thank you. Oh, well, so thank you.
thank you all for coming again. Um, and now we get to the fun part where we all get to talk to each other. Um, so I'm going to start with some moderated questions, and then we'll have time for audience questions as well. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, so my first question, one of the things that struck me as I was listening to all of you is that you all have that sort of imaginative, creative time that probably happens when you're alone. Um, and it's coming from your imagination and your personal experience. But you also all do work that requires collaborators and requires in some ways surrendering or giving up a little bit of control to those, those collaborators and their experience and their creativity. Um, so I'm curious, do you, is that, do you like that? Is there a side of that you like better? Do you, how, how, do you, how does collaboration fit into your practice? And I'll, sort of, I'll start with Bo and we'll just go on down the line. I should have chosen a different seat. <laughs> no, that's okay. fine. That's totally fine. Um, I think I should start by just saying, acknowledging that collaboration is actually a fundamental principle of my, collab of my creative process. So I seek out collaborators to create new work. And so in that, it's less about, it's less about having the idea and then building the team and the team either executing or you know, having that conversation after everything's fully baked but more about the expansive dialogue that happens through the whole creative process. And that I find that the process and if, if that the process of making the work is an art form in and of itself, right? And so by the time you get to that end result, not only have you made something beautiful, but you've deepened relationships from everyone who's worked on it together. And I really truly believe that that transforms the energy and energetic space of the of the performance or the installation or whatever that is. Um, I believe that that happens energetically. I also believe that it's um, much more pleasant <laughs> if we are building relationships as we're building the artwork, that it becomes fundamental to the piece. Um, in dance, I think collaboration is the, the fun, funniest part. So example, me as a choreographer, I got to work with Milwaukee Ballet Dancers. It was four weeks and I had three weeks to put 20 minutes ballet together. And I had no idea who they are, how strong, what kind of dancer they are. Some of them are strong as a contemporary dance, like I said, you know, it's less of like classical ballet. And some of dancers are just so strong classical work. So it is really interesting to see, to me, given like one step, like let's say one phrase of movement and see every dancer has different um, interpretation. So it was really that way and that kind of process inspired me how to, my work process. So as a um, dancer too, so I didn't know on stage in the studio how choreographer get inspired from us but now i see both sides and it's really like both sides of interacting me giving them in energy and they give me an idea and it's collaboration it all makes a whole thing i think yeah as i as i started by woke as a filmmaker the point of departure was different from my colleague here, is we have a very intense walk on stage or outdoor, and then when it's finished, uh, the, everything dismissed or disappear, and the, only the movie remain. We go into the editing and special effect and music and etc. So we do not keep this ongoing collaboration it is a really one intense you know, week or two week, depending on the length of the movie. Um, I think that when I see my trajectory to today, I think that when the painter is painting, we don't look for necessarily a social collaboration. He is alone with his canvas, put on it his composition, his imagination, his folly, his craziness, whatever he put in it. And I think that my 
fantasy or my idea is to reach this level of freedom in movie making. It means that, of course, the collaboration is something that enriches you. Accident, for example, or different talent. The colliding talent creates sometimes wing that take you up. But at the end, I think that there is something that um, I would like to create that has as minimum um, compromising between an idea or a feeling and what is in the final result. And I think that today technology, at the beginning of cinema, what happened, for example, if somebody shoots somebody, we know that it's fake, it is cinema. But still, on stage, somebody has a fake gun shooting a fake bullet on somebody who mimic receiving this and falling down. So the, the act was, in a way, exists somewhere on stage. Today, we don't need anything of that. Everything can be manufactured, virtualized, in a way that we, don't, we can create a world that doesn't exist or never exist. So the, the material that we have today, especially with new technology, uh, is really illimited or limited by our imagination and, and maybe budget or time. So I think that we are, I'm looking forward with uh, really excitement because I think that this uh, illimited world together with, um, with collaboration of a new kind is uh, extremely promising. Thank you. I'm going to go first with your question, so you keep that in mind. Uh, that's a good segue. I think one of the things, I, the other thing I was sort of thinking is, you know, clearly your work all takes a lot of work. You're dealing with technology or technical perfection in dance or the, you know, the musicians that are playing at the top of their game. There is a lot of work, but I think in some ways it seems like you're making art that is supposed to seem effortless, that the effect that maybe you want, you want the audience to just come in and, think about the artwork. They don't, you probably don't want them necessarily to think about all of the hours that went into that. You want them to just be in that moment with, with you, be in the film, be in the dance, be in the music. Um, as artists, do you think that makes you more of a perfectionist? Or are you maybe open to some accidents and some practice to get there? Or do you feel like everything has to be sort of pristine before it goes out into the world? And Yoram, I'm gonna let you go first. Well, I think that I think that the final um, project is driving the way that collaboration happen, and each project is has his own singularity and competence, etc. I will try to 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 create this frame that is unique to each project, and this will guide me in the choice that I will make then. In ballet, um, I don't think there's no way we can put a 12 hours long ballet just like this. So we need, um, so how it works, let's say we do Sleeping Beauty, um, it's like 12 hours long ballet and all of us like 40 dancers are working every day from 9.30 to 6. So that way we can work on our technique and then we can put the artistry so that we can communicate with um, audience. So I think um, working every day, um, more hours and that, like, that's our life, how we put our work together. Thank you. Um. I feel like there's a lot in that question, right? Um, just in thinking about sometimes I'll have, I think I've reached a point a few, many years back where I realized that each piece that I created wasn't the last piece, right? So understanding the importance of iteration, understanding the importance of learning from each project. So that sort of released that um, obsessive perfectionist 
and thinking more about it as process, thinking more about it as an ongoing dialogue that will be happening for years. I was gonna say the rest of my lifetime, but I don't know if I can still commit to that. Yesterday I was thinking I would give it all up and start baking bread, right? Like at opening a bakery, so. But for into the foreseeable future, right? This is an ongoing dialogue, so I can reflect back on my body of work and see how it all connects, and then think about what I learned from each one to make the next one um, a part of that ongoing dialogue. That being said, the role of the composer is to create essentially very detailed directions for musicians to create the work with or without me there. And so going back to your first question about collaboration, I can't expect musicians to trust me if they don't have scores and music, sheet music, that is as perfect as it can be because they can't do their job if I don't do my job as best I can, right? Um, so I think it speaks to the role of the composer and trying to be as perfect as possible with the execution so the musicians can do their work. However, the role of a interdisciplinary collaborative artist that can be much more process oriented and I can be a little bit more gentle with myself. Baking bread takes more perfection than anything I else. Know. So, right. yeah. <laughs> Measuring. And that's the whole Baking is science. Um, so, Dai Young, I'm going to start with you with this question. So, um, you all, you know, you talk about audience. Clearly, you all respect your audience and are thinking of your audience. Um, what do you, what kind of audience member do you like to be? What do you, what other art form or maybe even within your own genre, what, what do you like to see and what, what, what really turns you on as an audience member? Um, so, honestly, the ballet, before cur curtain rises, you just never know what's going to happen. There might be one audience out there, or there might be a thousand, two thousand. So for us, I think it is just because we love what we do, the most of dancers, we just love our job. So no matter what, how warm you guys are, how crazy you guys are, it doesn't really matter to us because we love it. We just want to be on stage and dance for someone who loves and who can share with our like love. So yeah, we just love having you. It doesn't matter if you're mean, if you're not. <laughs> yeah, as long as we can dance. Well, I don't want to repeat myself, but uh, when I finish my work, I do not meet when, with the public. The public do his own deal with the image. I am not where, there. I'm somewhere else writing my next chapter. So I don't have this um, relation with the audience. The only place that I can recall in which I create by the image a real relation with the audience uh, was when I was walking on a very large display that follow other stairs, very large monument, monumental stairs, and I create people going down that has the same size as people going up, the same. So when we are going, so I have my virtual world in a very similar perspective as a people that was inside the room climbing these stairs. And there I was curious to see what happened, that when you step on the stair and you see people going down that are the same size as you, doing the same things, looking at you, but are out on the other side of the sphere, in the virtual world. So this is the, the main connection that can happen in, in this um, interactive. This is, the, the, let's say, the, the only interactive work that I have done. Most of the time, really, my, when my work is finished, it has its own life. And I'm, I do not feel even in control. Mm -hmm. uh, people do it whatever they want with it. This is the, it, it belongs to the viewer. It does not belong to me anymore. Um, I would say that in terms of, and I, and I don't know if I miss remember your question, if you're asking what we, either way, either way. okay, um, there's so much to speak to, <laughs> that the idea of, you know, I, in terms of relating more specifically to audience, um, and thinking about the music 
in and of itself, the importance of leaving sort of breadcrumbs, um, whether it's through repetition or you know, re repetition one after the other, uh, a note or a musical phrase, that then gives audience something to sort of hold on to in terms of breadcrumbs. Um, in terms of what I enjoy, I, I enjoy really um, interdisciplinary work, performance work, immersive work. Really, it's less about the discipline and more about being surprised, right? And I find myself that it's, it becomes a test to me as an audience. Um, I've had experiences in immersive uh, installations where I would feel uncomfortable because the aesthetic is a little bit more jarring than what I'm naturally drawn to, or the sound might be a little bit more um, angular than what I'm used to or what I prefer. And so what I really enjoy is being able to walk away have a moment and then be able to return to that same space so that I can continue to grow and learn and be excited about something that is surprising to me either because I didn't like it and learned to understand where the artist was coming from and do that work as an audience member feels exciting to me um, that I want, to, I want to learn, I want to continue to grow, I want to continue to do that work. And that's the same for when I am creating work, I sort of have a teacher hat on, right, where I'm like, how can I help audiences learn how to engage with this work as the work progresses in a time-based platform? I wish to illustrate that. So um, a, few day, or a, few, a couple weeks ago, we made a video of the e exhibition that you'll all get to see. It'll be online. But we filmed some children going through Yoram's installation. And the camera happened to capture a little girl. She's five years old. And during one section of your video, we perfectly caught her on camera going, <gasps> in this perfect, beautiful gasp of surprise. Like, just that it's just her face. You can't see anything else. And it's just the most pure vision of someone being surprised by art. So watch out for that on the Art Center's website. It's really wonderful, and I'm so happy that they caught that. Um, I see Jill and Mia coming down now. So we are going to take some questions from the audience. Make sure you wait for the microphone so everyone can hear your question. So if you yep, just want to raise your hand. Mia, it looks like you've got a couple on that side. Thank you all for sharing uh, your process and, and your creations. Each of you shared a creation that was experienced as a sequence or as a full experience in itself. And then you shared with us visuals or snippets um, for us to feel something about what you were feeling. Are, are the items you shared with us new creations because we are a completely different audience than what than who experienced the whole thing or do you find yourself reinterpreting what you had uh, originally produced whether as a photograph whether as a an ascension or or even the entire score um i can say for the the examples that i shared tonight um everything that i showed tonight was i think the earliest piece was the piece of the Boston Public Library, and all the men and women were near, merely players, because <laughs> um, I like to write long titles. That that one that was 2017, so that was the most that was the furthest away. Um, the sound was um, 2018 into 2019, and then um, of Gravity and Light is premiering on April 22nd, 2022. <laughs> one night only. Please come, um, and so. That, I finished the score in January of 2022, but I'd been working on it since for a year. Um, and then the, everything else is coming up around it. And I think those are the three. Well, I am, um, I've taken a decision a few weeks ago I want to share with you. I've decided, it's a very important decision, I have decided to live forever. <laughs> because actually it takes all the stress of time from my mind. I don't need to run after anything. I have all the time. So today I'm, I think, 70? 70. 70. <laughs> And I feel really that I am at the beginning of my artistic career. Really, I 
sincerely think so. <laughs> I couldn't, you know. Um, so I, I have a double duty. I'm a dancer and choreographer. And those pictures that I share today, it was the most recent work that I did with Milwaukee Ballet Dancers, with Oklahoma City Ballet Dancer, and myself. <laughs> so yeah, that was the most recent one. I mean, Juliet one was like eight years ago. I want to go back just for a moment to the collaborative thing because for, for you two, someplace in your head, I suspect you have an idea, even though you, and you've played it, what you think the music's going to sound like and what the movements are going to be. And you have an idea what the movement's going to be and what the expression of the dancer is. But you don't really control those people. So when you see, if we had a second performance, after April 22nd, which we're all going to go to, <laughs> what would be your composer expectations, not of the first, but of the second, and your choreographers and performers' expectations, not of the first, but of the second? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I think in terms of, that's where the role of documentation honestly becomes a really powerful tool and something that's important to build into your production timeline, into your overall sort of like, so I'm of course documenting the score ahead of time. So musicians with all of the directions, so musicians know what the intention is, but also a recording is so very important. And I've also done a lot of writing about this piece, about what it's, you know, the intersections of the scientific concepts with the aesthetic and, and you know, literature that was inspiring to me during this point and all of that, right? The same thing though is doubly true for choreography that there's not a standard, to my knowledge, there's not a standard notation system for choreography. So like there is for music or for visual arts even. Um, then that way, so different choreographers have developed over the past many decades, a way to notate their process, notate descriptions of what the dance needs to be, the staging movements and language, and it's anything from graphics to, um, actual narrative, but then, you know, documenting it with video is incredibly important. And this piece, as it's being created, is a piece of music, dance and choreography and large scale projection. And so the expectation would be if Oklahoma City wanted to do with Gravity and Light next season, <laughs> that we would work and it would be a conversation at the very beginning of this is the intention, this is the aesthetic, this is the piece, and then a conversation with, well, would Tom Mattingly license his choreography to be set on a different um, company? And making sure that they have all of those tools and maybe he would visit and do some workshops and set that ballet there. Also, and this goes back to the iterative process, is that what an opportunity to think about what does that next, one look like? What did we learn from the first staging? What really was powerful? What could be a little bit different? And then having that conversation with the creative team um, to make sure that everybody feels excited about having that conversation, right? Did I give you too much? <laughs> did I answer your question? <laughs> I think it asks really how much, how much license do you want to give to the artist? Think of the different ways in which you've heard, like, the soliloquy from Hamlet spoken yes. yeah. by both director and actor's influence. As well, I, someone who's put, put this down and, and nailed it, how much are you affected by the performers and the other choreographers who may touch your work? Mm, I think and if I think I can answer it, that to maybe first comment, and I don't want this to just be a conversation between the two of us. <laughs> we, can, we can talk more about this later. But um, that I feel very honored. Like I feel like as if in my experience so far, 
and I'm, I'm not, I'm 42 years old at this point, so I'm still, I have a lot more work to be doing, but I feel very honored that it, musicians who do touch the work are very respectful, that choreographers that I work with are very respectful, and vice versa. So it becomes um, an exercise in trust, and I believe that trust is one of the core tenets of, of true collaboration. That you need to build that trust through honest dialogue, through respective discourse, to be open to new ideas, and to be, again, surprised if a cellist plays that solo and says, gosh, do you want me to put a, a mute here, and do you want me to hold this? And I'm like, Julie Sturm, yes, that's exactly what I was getting at. That's great, and I changed my notation, and um, we continue that dialogue um, in, a, in a trusting way. Um, so I think the thing that I love being an artist, I have no plan. So there's a body in front of me. So each time whenever I had to create a new work, I had different approach to work. Let's say this time I was so inspired by the music and I started putting steps, but then Someday, I don't like, just, I don't like anything. Oh, let's just try something new, something crazy. And it became um, edit more and it became a um, piece. So I think that's the really interesting way and I'm still discovering myself as a choreographer. So I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to build off of that question. Um, my question was if, in order for collaboration to occur, um, we, have, we have three experts in three very different fields on the stage here, and I wonder what each of you needs each other to know about your craft in order for collaboration to occur. So. No doubt, each of you is such an expert in what you do. How do you make collaboration occur by letting the other members of the collaborative team in on your craft? What do you need the others to know? I will divide this question to two aspects in my perspective. First. I think that there is something that is a convention between the audience and the stage that I want to break. It means it's not the audience and the stage. It's not a frontal relation. It's an immersive relation. It means something can happen around. You are not in a secure place. You are not sitting there looking at something. You are in something, in this. So you are in a danger, the same danger that the artist is. You, you, are, you are on stage as well. So this is one part. Uh, the um, collaboration part in this work is like a um, manufacturing dream for me. It is not about a... Uh, I have no um, con constraint or limitation of gravity, for example. I can fly. I don't have any problem do, to create this, the, the tree that doesn't exist, that have a leaf of, with birds. I mean that actually it's really manufacturing dream. This is my work today. And all the ingredients to this, as they are available to each of you, because everyone has dream at night, and you do your own crazy movie. This is a personal activity that everyone do for years. I try to translate it and to bring it into a common experience that I can share with a, with a group of people. So it's different also from the... Um, uh, let's say, virtual reality uh, eyeglasses, that you are isolated in your own dream. 
my aim is to create this kind of experience, this dream as a collective experience, that we, people can share a dream together. So, I don't know if I answer, but at least I just um, try. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I can say that with any new collaboration, um, where I start is just talking about what our process, right? And what we're interested in, what we're curious about, what our values are um, in the artwork, and just to see if we have the same fundamental foundational language, right? And then also going into looking at actual work and sharing work to see if we're executing that language in an aesthetic that resonates with us. Not the same, but something that feels like, when I started um, collaborating with Natalia Zubko for River, and we built River Constellation here in Des Moines, but other pieces in New York and whatnot, and um, when I called her up, I just called her and was like, I knew she was a friend of a, a good friend of mine. I didn't really know her, but I started, um, looking at her work online and I called her up and I said, Natalia Zepko, you're creating rooms that of how I want my music to sound. Like it just was, I love her work so much and could imagine my pieces in there and I was inspired to create music and vice versa. And so, you know, that's how I approach really pretty much all of that. So we have that fundamental starting point. And then I, again, going back to, I love learning. So like, will i've learned so much about light design because I, <laughs> for this project because i didn't want to show up to a meeting and ask dumb questions right like i think it's disrespectful to the time that we spend together it's disrespectful to their craft if i don't do my work to at least learn the language and not become an expert but at least learn the language and i find that i get that back from my from any sort of collaboration and team Collaborating. So it's just like there's no limit. So that's, I think, as a dancer, we want to be perfect. We want to be look good. So it's like we need to find with a, it's like dialogue between my dancers and myself. And um, it really comes from like nowhere to me, at least. And was that the question? Will you repeat that again? I just was going to your your answer uh, your question. Uh, what you would want other disciplines to know about your craft in order for collaboration to occur? Oh. So it's all about just using our body, and the body is the everything for dancers. So that's the. I guess answer I would say. Yeah. Well, we, we have one more question up here and then I think we'll, call, we'll respond to that question. I love that young people are engaged in this tonight. Thank you so much. We can't wait to hear what you're asking these artists. Um, I was going to ask because you look for perfection in uh, most of your work. If um, any time it happened that you failed uh, whenever you did, like on scene or with the music, or even with uh, all screens, on screens, and I guess it's a bit harder than baking bread. <laughs> so failed bread is a big disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to take that first? Question about that? As a dancer myself, of course. Like I said, it can be perfect. We are working towards perfection. But on stage, when you get nervous, there's a thousand, two thousand audience out there. You do weird things. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you know the steps, it's not about. So we, are, we learn from what we did. And I think that's why experience is really important as a dancer and choreographer as well. I, even though you fail, you know how to make it look like you didn't make mistake. 
And it's it's good to it's it's okay to fail as a dancer, and I think that's being a human. And I think audience likes it. Mm, they don't. I don't. I wouldn't say they like it, but it's a live performance, and anything can happen. And as a performer, in that is okay. And just it's not all about being perfection, even though those little things happen. Just be connected with audience and tell the story through your heart, and I think that is more important than just worry about feeling. Yeah. I think that we have moment in which we have expectation that was not fulfilled. We call it failure because there is no correspondent between what we expect and what we get. Uh, with distance, we realize that, of course, this is uh, very relative. And what is important is how we understand what we did to make it better the next time. And I think that this is uh, one of the reasons that I have decided to live forever. <laughs> Um, I think it's honestly, it's such a good question. I think in terms of, well, a couple of things is that I feel like just as we do a lot of work around defining success and like what does success really mean in an artwork or what does really success really mean in a relationship or in an organization and how do you define that? I think similarly you want to define what failure means. And for me, it understanding, for example, for a tangible example, because I've already talked about the importance of notation, um, as I was trying so hard to get everything um, perfect for the musicians for our first rehearsal at Iowa PBS, and it's the first time I'm meeting most of the musicians, I've known a couple of them, I showed up, I'm super nervous because it's such a vulnerable thing to give over a score to musicians to then interpret your music in front of your face in real time and to be like, oh my gosh. So it's, a, it's an unnerving experience in and of itself. I thought I did a genius move by just cutting out measures of musicians who weren't playing in certain scenes. For those of you who play music, that changes all of the measure numbers in that person's part. So we're in the middle of a movement and all the measure, like every single person had a different measure number for the same corresponding part. And I, I was mortified and what, what, what that taught me, and because I think failure is so important for iteration, for learning, for growth, is that next day everything was 100% perfect. Also, I use it as an opportunity to be humble, to apologize, to stop the rehearsal share more with them about this overall piece to create an opportunity for us all to connect so that we could continue the rehearsal so it was an opportunity. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do that even five years ago because I would have been a mess, right? But it's about understanding why failure is important um, to grow in the art form but also to grow in the community or the, the bonding experience as well. That's well, a perfect you. good question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's a, like a failure even to the word failure because it just signals growth. So that, there's some like language problems there. Audience, thank you for coming back out to the Des Moines Arts Center. Hopefully we will be back again with more in-person talks and programs. Um, unfortunately, the museum is closed now, but um, as you probably know, we're a free institution. Please come back. And if you haven't seen Yorm's work um, in the exhibition, Immersive, please come and see the show, see the other artworks. Um, something I want to say about dance is, is we had a dance program here, also with Ballet Des Moines, several years ago. And someone said, I didn't even know I needed to see that. So how powerful dance can be if you don't think you're um, a fan of dance, Get, try it. Please go and see um, Of Gravity and Light on April 22nd. <laughs> and, so, and thank you for your support of the arts and have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>